And here we are, November the 13th, 2016, lecture discussion 261, number 261 on the book of uh, Romans. I, I have some excerpts from some letters to read, just for the fun of it. I got one from a gentleman named Corey. Uh, Dear Pastor Chronister and to all the faithful volunteers of Cliffside, I'm the son of Joni from Cincinnati, otherwise known as a hard sell. Joni from Cincinnati wrote me a letter a long time ago saying I would send, I would give more people uh, access to your website, but you are a hard sell. Do you remember that? It's very funny. This is her son. A hard sell you may be, but she has now, she has now two others besides herself watching and listening. Thank you for taking the time to put your sermons on YouTube. Your audio sermons are great as well, but I get a whole lot more out a whole lot more out being able to see you and the dry erase board. You said in one of your YouTube videos that you hate the way you look and sound, explicitly that you feel like you have a large tongue and you have a lisp. It's not a feeling. I have a large tongue and a lisp. Never sit in the front row here. It's like a Gallagher concert if you okay. You have to know who Gallagher is, I guess now, don't you? But <laughs> let me see where am I? You sound great. We, uh, Costco, uh, Corey, does provide uh, hearing protection and hearing analysis, so uh, no, no offense. Just as, a, just as something you might consider. I've never noticed once that you are slurring your words or lisping. So it's just in your head. No, it's not. I'm afraid there's way too much evidence, but that's cool. I appreciate that I'm coming through somewhat. I know it's not easy to watch yourself because I would feel the same way, but honestly, you should feel totally at ease in front of the camera. If there was one thing I could change uh, about the presentation, it would be that diet, it would be that diet coke to a regular coke. I'm not a fan of aspartame due to the fact it's a neurotoxin. But you knew that. <laughs> yes, I do know that. I, I think I'm staving off Alzheimer's. I think in my case, it's a, it's a function of my, and I have the evidence to prove it. I'm not uh, subject to Alzheimer's at this time. And I drink a diet soda every Sunday. There must be some kind of relationship. I uh, just wanted to let Supper Dave, a great nickname by the way, know that I have added jokes from the, uh, that I like the added jokes from the graphics he puts up from time and time, or puts up from time to time. I can't see today. And uh, so Dave, he's the one. Yeah, that, that likes it. So just in case. Thank you for teaching me that Jesus is never not God and that salvation is a free gift from God. Uh, I have struggled with the mixing of law grace from past erroneous theology. I enjoy your in-depth teaching and love your sense of humor. I always get a kick out of hearing about the buffet, how everyone is sleeping during the sermon, and when you ask the congregation to raise their hands and then tell them to never raise their hands. So, so evidence that my jokes are funny, right here. <laughs> yes, you. Was, it, it, I, I think I wrote him back and told him that the, the, uh, the class is convinced that I write my own letters. <laughs> John uh, from Pennsylvania, who is a, uh, a man who has uh, devoted himself to Scripture, he sends this quote to us. Uh, I said something that was close to this, and this is uh, much better and far more accurate. You are only intelligent when you realize you are not. So I wanted to pass that along uh, with his permission. Okay, welcome back to our unceasing pursuit of wisdom by means of Revelation 17, 1 through 18. So let's get them on the board as much as we can. That's where we are primarily, but you cannot go there unless you're also in Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. So that's uh, the unceasing aspect of what we've got. I should also add Revelation 13, 18. I'll race those here in a minute, but that is, uh, if you've missed a few weeks, that is uh, the context of all of this for the last uh, month or so. God has placed wisdom in his word. He says, I have put wisdom in here. It is a wisdom status report. You can evaluate yourself by saying, 
Do I have wisdom? Well, if I have wisdom, then I will understand Revelation 17, 1 through 18. I will understand Revelation 13 through uh, uh, verse 18. And I will understand Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, chapters 2 and 7. Those are the elements of wisdom as God defines it. And God has placed wisdom in his word and some of his wisdom is more so applicable to particular time periods or sections of time. And I think that is the case here. I believe Revelation 17 is for us, our time. So it is particularly important uh, if you are a seeker of wisdom to know about what will occur during your span. The mind that has wisdom will reconstruct the seven heads. Or seven heads. It is wisdom to know what that means. The mind that has wisdom will know the beast that was and is not and yet is. Was. Is not. Yet is. Oops. Who is it? The, be, the, the mind that has wisdom will know who that is. Is himself, the beast is himself also the eighth and is one of the seven. So he's the eighth, but he's also one of seven. And, and understanding that becomes of primary importance. That is a mid-tribulational event, by the way. You might have, uh, you might have heard me say that in weeks by. There went everyone's buffet right there. It's gone. Okay, just mine. I'm doing better. I listen to people on, on TV all the time, and they use that phrase over and over and over and over again. It's annoying. I can't stand it. It's my phrase. I should be getting some kind of benefit financially from it. It's not a happening. The mind that has wisdom will know the meanings of the seven heads. The beast that was, is not, yet is, will ascend from the abyss or the pit and will go to perdition. That is the mind that has wisdom. That that also understands that the beast is the eighth of the seven and also one of the seven. The mind that has wisdom will know the meaning of the ten horns. There's ten horns. Revelation. It's also in Daniel. And the mystery of the harlot. What I'm saying for those who find me incomprehensible, of which there are legions, is that we, us, now, are the generation that for certain, I believe, will see those ten horns. We, I believe, well, I'll get into that as time goes by. So it, it becomes incumbent on us to know at least what they are. The ten horns will be seen by us. We are that generation. The ten horns are specifically relevant to our time. Now, with that constituted, it, it needs to be underscored that nothing in Revelation 17 or Daniel 2 or Daniel 7 can be isolated. You can't study Revelation 17 without Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. To try is futile. Well, not futile. It is just un ill-advised. You'll get something. Word does not come back void. But you will have an incomplete picture. As you know, I take trumpet lessons from a terrific, terrific player here in Anchorage. Probably, in my view, his tone is uh, superb and without peer in this state. Um, and he, uh, I, I, we tried to figure out how the trumpet works. It is a very difficult instrument mechanically to operate. In other words, your body is the machine that powers the trumpet. The trumpet is a reflection of what your body is doing. There's hundreds of techniques. And so as a puzzle, I've been doing it now for almost three years. I have tried to break down. I believe that I have the capacity to figure out a piece of pipe. Uh, apparently it's taken me three years. But we are closer and closer. We're working as kind of a duo. He doesn't know that, uh, but we're, we, we're always trying to figure out that which is the missing piece that'll, that'll cause this sound to change. And every trumpet player I have ever met, and I have not met very many, but I've got on the internet and found thousands of them, they all have one or two pieces. 
and they do not have all of them. The, the smallest I can get my list of things you have to do to play a trumpet correctly is 12. And I'm not sure I have all of them. And you have to do them in the right order. You make one mistake, the trumpet won't work. So the body has to do 12 things in, in succession at the right level in order to make a sound that sounds pleasant. I can make a sound. No one wants me to, especially my neighbors. Uh, horses, children, cattle. Nobody wants me to blow that thing unless I put it into the right form. And there's so many things to do. I have to think about my legs. I think about my head position. I bring that up because uh, this is Revelation 17. It's a similar puzzle. You will find pieces here that won't make any sense to you until you find them here. And then that won't help you until you find them in Daniel 2. That won't help you until you go to Daniel 7. Then you'll end up in Daniel 10. Then you'll end up in Revelation 19. Finally, you will have all the pieces, but will you have them in the right order? It is wisdom to not just have them, but it is wisdom to have them also correctly uh, formulated. And my trumpet teacher said something to me for the first time. He said it to me, Six times I counted. He said, that was excellent. Now, don't get too carried away. There was a lot of, that was not good in there. <laughs> but that was excellent. Uh, and I am solving this ridiculously complicated machine by the same method that I used, that I was taught by Scripture. Find the pieces put them in the right order, figure out why they're where they are and what they mean individually and collectively. And that's what's so cool on the trumpet is that there's failure if you don't do it, immediate failure. It's like sitting next to a guy with a, a buzzer. Every time I play it, it's the buzzer. So I can't have to change, constantly change in order to get it right. Okay, bring that up because you can't isolate Revelation 17, Daniel 2, Daniel 7. You cannot. The ten toes, you're going to run into ten toes, ten horns. That They can only be understood as that which is subsequent to the five that has fallen, the one is and the one that is yet to come. So I have to have the right order in order to get the ten horns properly placed. Then I have to know the ten horns are also ten toes. I have to also know that the ten horns, the ten toes, are ten kings. But they come after the five have fallen and the one is. If I try to put the ten horns and the ten kings and the ten toes into the five that have fallen, or put them into the one is, and they're not in the right order in the one is, I can put them in the one is, but the one is has an order. None of that makes sense. That's good. That's the point. The seven heads with each of their seven kings. The ten horns are ten kings. The seven empires have seven kings. The, you have all of these things that fit together yet are distinct and separated and you have to know how to distinguish them. You, it's important to distinguish the seven kings and the ten kings. Uh, Revelation 17.10 through Revelation 17.12. Seven heads and seven kings, ten horns, ten toes, ten kings. I'm repeating it just to get you used to the vocabulary. If I can get you to listen and hear the vocabulary, eventually yeah, uh, it begins to, I think, take hold for you. Daniel 7, I have four beasts. Daniel uh, and... Uh, Daniel 2, I have the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So Daniel 7, I have four beasts. Daniel 2, I have this image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar, blah, blah. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in which there was a golden head on a statue, if you want to think of it that way. Golden head, arms and chest of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron, but the iron is mixed with clay in the toes and the feet. So, 
reconciliation of the four beasts and the image of Nebuchadnezzar is important in order to understand the five that have fallen, the one is and the one that is yet to come and is also there's an eight. All I'm doing to you is pushing the vocabulary. Do I expect you to understand me? No. Just repeat the vocabulary. The four beasts must be reconciled with the five parts of the image, as should the seven heads. And all of that is required to understand what's going to happen in our time. could happen in any time. We could see this in the next six months begin to form. Our time as of today is the two legs of iron of Nebuchadnezzar's vision. That's where we are today. When you read Daniel 2 and you see the image of Nebuchadnezzar, when you get to the two legs of iron, that's us. That is our age. The iron tooth beast is the one is of the seven heads. So this is easy as cake, piece of pie. Again, our time... We have a horse in the fight to consider, a dog in the race. And before you insist that I'm mixing metaphors, uh, there really are horse fights, right? And there are dog races. Pies do divide into pieces. I can buy a cake from Sam's Club. That's pretty easy. Easy as cake, piece of pie, works fine. No problem. Horse fight, dog race. I stand on solid water. I do, as opposed to flowing ground. I lived through the 1964 earthquake. What happened to the ground? It flowed like it was, it liquefied. So, it's November. The water is solid. Duh, you're in Alaska. 9.2 9.2 on the Richter, Richter scale will liquefy the ground. So, solid water everywhere, flowing ground. Okay, where was it? Seven heads, five metals, four beasts. Not really five metals, four metals, but one of the metal mixes with clay. So I'm calling it five metals, but I know it's really only four metals. So we're going to have to make an artistic diagram just in case you need some clarity. So, all of that was the introduction that I do not expect you to understand. And once you get control of this, that's how you will explain it to somebody else who will think you're crazy. Uh, Revelation 17 has seven heads. It sounds like going to St. Ives. I met a man who, whatever, seven heads, seven wives, I don't know how many went to St. Ives. Okay. Revelation 17 has seven heads. One, two, three, four, five have fallen. Five have fallen. The sixth one is the one that is. The seventh is the one that is yet to come. John wrote this so that the one that is, John was living at that time. Somebody tell me, but I won't put it on the internet, but you you tell me, raise up, which one are we living in? What number? Of the seven heads, that's correct, you're correct. Good. That's important to know. There's also an eight. And then there are ten kings, or ten horns that are ten kings. So that is Revelation 17, broken down very fast. Now Daniel 2... There's four metals. There's gold on the head. There's silver 
chest and arms, four medals on the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Image of Neb in his dream. Silver on the chest of arms, bronze on the belly and thighs, and then there is iron on the legs, and iron mixed with clay on the feet and toes. How many legs do you have in the image? Two legs. How many feet? How many toes on the feet? Ten toes. Note that there are ten horns and ten kings. What do you think are the chances that the ten horns reflect the ten horn or the ten toes reflect the ten horns and the ten kings? High. Very high. Daniel seven. Gotta go fast because if I don't, we have four beasts. Here we have seven heads. Here we have an image of Nebuchadnezzar. Here we have four beasts of the vision of Daniel. Can you hear me? Am I getting through being away from that now that our sound system is down? There's a lion. There's a lopsided bear. And each one of these have, the lion has wings plucked off of it. That becomes something we have to do. The bear has ribs in its mouth and it's offset and one side's higher than the other. And some people believe that is easily decided. I'm going to tell you it's not easily decided. They attach that to the fact that uh, that particular empire uh, had an uneven aspect to it. The leopard, four-headed leopard. All of these things are a lot more complicated than most people will say. Uh, we'll get into it as the weeks go by. And then the iron beast. There is an iron beast. What are the chances that the iron beast and the iron legs and the iron mixed with clay has a relationship? Very high. So you can see every place has more information to tell us what it is that's being done here in these images. Okay, so what are the known knowns? Well, for starters, we know what the gold head is. We're absolutely definitively told. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that it is Nebuchadnezzar who is the head of gold. So let's read that so you see that and you have that known known in your system. Oops. I hate it when I, my markers fall out. Let's see, where do I want to go here? Let's make sure I've got it right. Daniel 2, 36 through 39. can barely see anymore. This is the dream. Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, has this dream with this image, and he wants to know what it is. If you don't tell him what it is, you're not a magician, or you're not a magi, you're not a wise man, and if you can't tell him, he kills you. His wise men, of course, couldn't figure it out. Daniel knew what it was. So all the wise men lived because Daniel knew what it was. What did those wise men do? You know the story. They all became very devoted to the guy that saved their lives. And then what did they do? They had sons. Daughters, And then what happened to the sons and daughters? The sons and daughters, because Daniel could interpret and explain this dream, that, that Nebuchadnezzar never told anybody the aspects of it. He never said it was a dream about an image. He just said, I have a dream, explain it to me or I'll kill you. Daniel solved it. Saved hundreds, if not thousands, of men's lives. Their sons became the men that came to see Christ. That's how it fits together. So you know it directly fits to the coming of Christ. So here we go. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. He's telling the king what the dream is and then what it means. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the of heaven, of the heaven, he has given them to your hand, into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. The head of gold, head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you can spell.
Nebuchadnezzar, then you get to be leader. That's just a joke. I'm just grateful I can do it on a board. It's not as easy to spell on a board as it is on a paper. It's different, and it makes you weird. Okay, I was already weird. Makes me more weird. It's not easy. Highly skilled professional to do to write Nebuchadnezzar on a board. Don't never mind. So notice that Nebuchadnezzar is a king of kings. Who else is a king of kings in the Bible? This is extraordinary. God gives him this kingdom. God gives him a kingdom, calls him a king of kings. He's got power, he has strength, and he has glory. Nebuchadnezzar is a fascinating typological story. When you study him, he wrote scripture, Daniel 4. He wrote it. He's a Gentile, Babylonian uh, pagan. He ends up in the, in the Bible writing scripture. Fascinating story he is. These words by themselves, God has given Nebuchadnezzar a kingdom and power, strength and glory. They are extraordinary. God himself giving to this Babylonian king. And immediately we got to ask why. Why is Nebuchadnezzar chosen for this? Why him? Why is this for Nebuchadnezzar? Why is Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold ultimately is the question, right? But in addition, the kingdom that God gives him is a worldwide kingdom. Wherever men dwell, or beasts dwell, or birds, the whole of the earth is yours. That's extraordinary. What does it mean? Who else in scripture had complete dominion over the whole of the earth, all the beasts, all the birds, all the creatures? Who had dominion? It's clearly an Adamic reference, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. There's a relationship between Adam and Nebuchadnezzar. Ask why. Ezekiel discusses it in Ezekiel 26, 7. For thus says the Lord YHVH. Whenever you see uh, YHVH, I mean that's, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I will come against Tyre from the north. It will be Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Let me stop right there. Tyre has a Satan Antichrist component, Ezekiel 28, 11. Oh, maybe I should should read that about Tyre really fast. How fast can I go? Let me see. Ooh, that's ten verses. I'm going to do it. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. God sends Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Tyre. When you see the geographical location of Tyre, uh, you have to know what Tyre was. Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is talking about Tyre. Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am God. Tyre says that to the face of God. I sit in the seat of God's, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. How smart was Tyre. Tyre thought they were a God. God says you're not. I'm going to send somebody to kill you. He sends Nebuchadnezzar. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. That's what Tyre thinks. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasure. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, therefore, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you. That stranger, the first stranger, was Nebuchadnezzar. The most terrible of the nations. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. So, I said that Tyre has a Satan element to it. It also has an Antichrist element. And you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. 
Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God, but you shall be a man and not a God. In the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. So you see this throw you down into the pit. Uh, all of those elements there uh, rising up, considering themselves to be as God. That is a satanic uh, component as well. So Tyre has a tremendous amount of information in it that, that complements other information. And to know, first and foremost, that Tyre ended up being the center of commerce of the Middle East at the time that they were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. God had them destroyed because they sinned against someone, and he didn't allow it. And that someone was his beloved city, Jerusalem, Ezekiel 26.2. So, here comes Jerusalem again. This is a lot of information. Jerusalem is the beloved city. They are destroyed by the one who destroys the beloved city. Tyre is. Tyre attacks Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed Jerusalem, ends up destroying Tyre. So God punishes Tyre because they attacked his beloved city. But Nebuchadnezzar did also. Got all of that? Hope you do. Probably don't. But once more, God's city, his beloved, again, the mystery of Jerusalem, just like many mysteries contained. Uh, um, let me just say it this way. Revelation 10, 7 says there's one mystery, the mystery of God. Then there's all kinds of mysteries inside of that. The mystery of Jerusalem is inside the mystery of God. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. It's got something to do with Jerusalem. It always seems to have something to do with Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, so Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar is the empire of gold. Note that every time there is a head, there's a king. Here I have a head. I'm sorry, every time there's a head, there's a king and a kingdom. Here I have a head, gold, and there is a king and a kingdom with it. I have silver, there is a king and a kingdom with the silver. I have bronze, there is a king and a kingdom in the bronze. I have iron, there is a king and a kingdom in the iron. So I identify the kingdom, I also have to identify the king that, that God has selected out to be that kingdom, or that king of that kingdom. And we know... Now that the head, uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, they're the first of this process. Babylon is the first Gentile kingdom to possess the beloved city. That becomes our criteria. Nebuchadnezzar came with his army and destroyed the Temple of Solomon and he left Jerusalem in ruins. The military aspect of conquering of Judah is what I'm talking about, and it came in three phases, 605 B.C., where can I put this, 605 B.C., 597 B.C., and of course you would know, I hope by now, 586 B.C. There were three aspects to, of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of our three-phase process. And that's not a coincidence, it's not a coincidence that he did it in this order. He swept through Assyria, and then he went to Egypt and took Egypt, and then he came back and took Judah. Israel was already gone, right? Who took Israel? The Assyrians, Sennacherib, took the northern tribes. Israel, Judah, two parts of one country. One called Israel, the other called Judah. Both of them are known as Israel. So, Nebuchadnezzar took out Jerusalem in three phases, beginning in 605, 597, 586. Daniel was taken in 605. He was taken in the first phase. So he saw all of it from the Babylonian perspective. It's not a coincidence, is it, that he takes Assyria, Egypt, and Judah? What is that? That's Isaiah 19. That's the great prophecy, the great blessing of, Assyria, of the road between Assyria, Judah, 
and Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar did all three of that. Now, I'm getting bogged down. The key point is Jerusalem is under the feet of the Gentiles for the first time, initiating the times of the Gentiles, 586 B.C. Daniel, again, saw his belo- the beloved city now totally under the authority of the Babylonian pagans. And so he was consumed. He wanted to know, when is it going to stop? How long before... The time of the Gentiles having the beloved city under their feet. When will that end? When will the Jewish king of kings come? Nebuchadnezzar is a king of kings. When will the Messiah, the real king of kings, come? Thus he goes about uh, taking every experience he has and God gives him information. The purpose of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Daniel wrote Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 for the trying to figure out when the end of the time of the Gentiles that started in 586 B.C. would end. That's his question. That's his purpose. Every vision he had, every interpretation he had, every experience he had, he believed had some implication to that. And the purpose of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, and Matthew 24, is answering that question. The disciples come to Christ in Matthew 24. Solve Daniel 2, Daniel 7 for us. That's what they wanted to know. And Christ does in Matthew 24. He solves Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. It's wisdom to know when the times of the Gentiles will end. And why the beginning was the beginning and why the end is the end. And the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, is the beginning. How long has it gone on? It's still going on. It hasn't ended. Daniel saw the beginning. Somebody sees the end. I think it's you. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold that he initiates the beginning of the time of the Gentiles. He destroys the beloved city. He possesses the the beloved city. And most people think that Nebuchadnezzar should be, therefore, the first of the seven heads. But he's not. He's the third of the seven heads. The 17.9 of Revelation. He's the third king. Babylon is the third kingdom of Revelation 17.9. This is evident because we can identify the iron beast of the four beasts. We know who the iron beast is. And as soon as we know who he is, then all we have to do is subtract and count backwards, right? That's what I discussed last week. Once I identify the iron beast and the iron legs... Then the iron toes mixed with clay, simple, subtraction. I can find out where Nebuchadnezzar fits. So, I know the iron beast, or the iron legs, actually the iron beast. John saw the iron beast. He did not see the iron legs or the iron toes mixed with clay. Does that make sense? So this would be, now all I have to do, there's Nebuchadnezzar, here's silver, here's bronze, here's iron. Now, it becomes obvious that that's the case. I'm just speeding it a little bit for you today just to get you started. We'll we'll work it all out so you understand how I get iron in this position as the one is of John. Remember, the element that is the most significant, what makes you a beast, what makes you a metal, what makes you one of the five fallen, is what? What does it? What makes you one of the five fallen? What makes you one of these four metals? What makes you one of these four beasts if you're a kingdom or a king? What is the defining criteria? The beloved city. Yes. Israel. Jerusalem. 
having control of Jerusalem, control of the beloved city. That is the element that is the most significant. Significant. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon begins the clock. Daniel experiences the gold head. He also experienced the silver arms and chest. He witnessed the rising of the inferior kingdom. Now he tells Nebuchadnezzar, but after you shall arise another kingdom, verse 39 of chapter 2, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth, and then the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. So they're inferior metals, but when we get to the fourth, this becomes an incredibly strong kingdom. And the criteria that put them on the list in both places is that they had control of, they took authority over, they possessed the beloved city. Right? Got it? Good. So again, Daniel lived through the first of the uh, first two of the five fallen heads. He lived. Uh, where am I? He, I'm sorry, the first two, I said that back. He lived through these two. He lived through heads three and four of the five followers. This becomes an issue. We have to identify one and two. As an aside, you can see why the Assyrian Egyptian position with respect to one and two is so popular because Nebuchadnezzar wipes them out and they, everybody thinks, okay, they should be, this should be Egypt, that should be Assyria. Because Assyria did try to take Jerusalem. Uh, Egypt effectively released them to Jerusalem and so they should be in that list. But you have a problem, right? What's the problem? Neither Egypt nor Assyria had control of the beloved city. So therefore, they can't be on the list. Who had the beloved city? Who took the beloved city from God, if you will? That's a humanistic way of looking at it, because that can't take it from God. He possessed everything. Here, it's the question of why does Satan want the beloved city? Why does he want it? What happened here? Satan wants it. And you see this struggle. It's not really a struggle. It's like there's an old... Um, Far side joke, of playing God at Jeopardy. I don't know if you remember that, you have to be my age again. God got all the answers right. Ooh, God wins again. God has 200,000. Ooh, the defending champion has yet to score. Okay, that's, that's what you're up against there. Satan is not going to, you're not going to get the beloved city from God, but it looks like it to us. It's a humanistic, a human perspective. So, uh, why does Satan want the beloved city? Key question. Submit your proposals. Publishers are waiting. You will see the Nimrod Sodom position if you begin to look this through. Did Nimrod have control of Jerusalem? Did Sodom have control of Jerusalem? Hmm. After the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar, after the kingdom, which is the Babylonian Empire, and Nebuchadnezzar, which is the king, again, seven heads are always both the king and the kingdom. They're identified individually as such. Sometimes they're referencing both. Sometimes they're re referencing just the kingdom. Sometimes just the king. After the Babylonians slash Nebuchadnezzar will come the chest and the arms. The silver. And if we were to apply symmetry to the vision of the four beasts, then Nebuchadnezzar would be which of these beasts? If Nebuchadnezzar is the gold of the image, which beast would he be? Well, he would be the lion. Then the silver would be the bear. And the leopard. And iron to iron, right? It's obvious that it is iron to iron. And, and if, if you were to recognize that Nebuchadnezzar, as the lion, the lion has the heart of a man. The beast was raised up, and clearly that's salvific language that is appropriate to Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar is a saved man. He is raised up and given the heart of a man. He was a beast raised up into a man. Daniel chapter 4, again, written by Nebuchadnezzar. He praises the true God, the most high God, the holy God. Daniel 4, 1 through 9. Daniel 4, 16 directly tells us that Nebuchadnezzar is the lion 
of Daniel 7.4. Okay, it doesn't tell you that directly. It, you, it's indirectly. But it gives us Nebuchadnezzar as the lion. Take some thought, some time. Enjoy. You'll do it. Let me restate the criteria. The criteria is control of the holy beloved city, Jerusalem. So after Nebuchadnezzar is the lopsided bear, the silver chest and arms, inferior to gold, silver inferior, less than Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and then the leopard as the bronze belly and thighs. John, again, was alive for the one is. The one is has the same criteria. It would be what came after Nebuchadnezzar, what, came at, what empire came after Nebuchadnezzar and had control of Jerusalem, what empire came after that empire and had control of Jerusalem, and then what empire came after that one and had control of Jerusalem. That's the one is. And I know who that one is, is. That's the Romans. The iron, the iron beast, the iron kingdom, the sixth head is the Roman Empire. Now I've got to erase this and focus on Rome. So now I have the iron empire. And it has a king. And it is the sixth head. What comes after the Roman Empire, or the Iron Empire is a better way of saying it, is who? Who comes after the Iron Empire has fallen? Five have fallen. We don't know who one and two is. We know that, that gold has fallen, or the lion has fallen. We know that silver has fallen. I'll identify who, who we believe those are. That's the bear. And we know that uh, bronze has fallen, and that's the leopard. Now we have the iron. That would be the sixth head. After the sixth head is the seventh and the eighth. Who is that? That is the Antichrist. Those five have fallen. Again, you can make some money putting this in a book and selling it while time's still there on who's one and two. I'll give you some suggestions. Go out, make sure you, you help the cliffside, you know, those little money so that we can get a better buffet. These five have fallen. One is... John was alive at the time of the Roman Empire and he knew that the Roman Empire was ferocious. It did something that no one else had ever done before from a governmental aspect. Won't get into that, but the Iron Kingdom, the sixth head, has divisions, doesn't it? It has, you read it all back, it has iron teeth, have been devoured, has bronze claws, it takes a little aspect of the other. But then it has two iron legs. And then it has uh, ten iron toes mixed with clay. So. There I go. So that sixth head is complicated. It divides. It divides at least twice. Some will argue over that. And there's some disagreement as to the exact nature. But we know that the iron beast has stages, has divisions. The sixth stage, I'm sorry, the sixth head has these stages to it. We don't know the uh, their disagreement as to the exact nature, how many stages, but pretty much everyone agrees with me. Okay, that last part is yet to be demonstrated. There's still time. By combining the dream of Nebuchadnezzar with the vision of Daniel, we can conclude that the iron toothed beast is the united stage of the sixth head. 
So here's the sixth head. That is the United States. That means of the iron beast, I have one time of it where it is a singular unit. It hasn't divided yet. And that is the one is. John saw the Roman Empire in a united form. He did not see it divide. You went to eighth grade history where you were taught that the Roman Empire has divided into two stages or to two legs, right? By combining again the dream of Nebuchadnezzar with the vision of Daniel, we can figure out the iron tooth beast is this united stage of the Roman Empire. And therefore the two legs of the United States are the next two divisions, or the two parts. And after that two parts comes will be the ten toes division, or the ten horns division, if you will, or if you'd like, the ten kingdoms, or if you wish, the ten kings. Does that all make sense to you? It's all the same. Just a little, gives you a little bit more information. Remember that Daniel wrote his book during the Babylonian captivity. He was captured in the first siege. So Rome didn't come for almost 470 years. He wrote about Rome being a united kingdom that divided into two and then divides into ten almost 500 years before Rome showed up. They don't believe the book of Daniel was written by Daniel. They can't explain how he would know all of this history before it happened. He got it perfect. He got he got Medo-Persia perfect. He got the Alexander the Great perfect. He got Rome absolutely flawless. He didn't know, we didn't know, that it would divide in, into two iron legs until Constantinople fell. Rome was Rome until 364 A.D. It was in the United States until 364 A.D. Iron legs. So it was a unit for a long time. And then it split into two. Rome, Constantinople. Again, showing off my spelling skills. Rome fell in 480, 476 A.D. Constantinople collapsed in 453. It took that long for the two legs to show to to be full. When Rome fell, what happened to its political class? You've had this lecture before here. What happened to its political class? Where did it go? It's social economic class. It's intellectual class. Where did they go? Did they die in the siege? No. When the Mongols came, did the head of, of Rome fall? No, they always get away. Where'd they go? They went north. Into what? Into France. Its political class went to France, eventually becoming the Holy Roman Empire of France, led by, eventually, Charlemagne. And that is Western Rome. Eastern Rome, Constantinople fell in 453. And where did they go? By the way, what do I call, after France, after Charlemagne was, uh, fell, um, the Roman Empire metamorphosed into Germany and was called uh, the Holy Roman Empire of Germany. And they call the heads of their empire Caesars. Just like Rome did. They just spell it different. But that means Caesar. And the it Constantinople fell, of course, it went into Russia, where they called their heads Caesars. So east and west is France and Germany. I'm sorry, west is France and Germany, east is Russia. That's how it worked. There's an irony now, by the way. 
God. Some people have suggested electric treatments, both after and during the lecture. I was so proud that I'd gone at least, I'd, I'd had it down to one, yeah, two weeks. There are people who count here, not just on the internet. You counting people on the internet, fie on you. <laughs> it's very funny. I, I can't tell you how much I like, I like it. It's just hilarious. <clears throat> the irony of Russia now in your lifetime, be, get it, irony? Uh, uh, let me help you. Irony, please clap. Thank you. The irony of Russia in concert with Turkey against the beloved city today is fascinating. Because Russia is still in the Iron Beast. It is the eastern side. It is the eastern leg of the two legs. And it is cooperating with Istanbul, which was Constantinople. Anyway, we find ourselves still within the two iron legs. This is us. We're still here. It's lasted for thousands of years, 2,000 almost years. We have the two legs of the iron beast, which is the fourth beast of Daniel and is the end of the image of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 2, and is the one is of Revelation 17. So what are we waiting for? What comes after the iron legs? the ten toes mixed with clay. And now, Revelation 17 tells you that the ten toes is the same as the ten horns, and there are ten kings of ten horns, which are ten kingdoms and ten kings, which is also ten toes, which is mixed with iron and clay. Got it? I said it correctly, sort of. It's hard to say it incorrectly. It's all the same thing. All of it. When you get that, you're in real good shape. So I have ten toes, iron toes. This is the last of the three phases. I have three, some have four. They're, they're going to eventually agree that I'm right. Mm -hmm. I'll work on them. Many insert a one world government in here. They say that there is a one world government and they'll put it in a couple of places. Most of the time it's right here. They'll say there's a fourth stage, a one world, world government stage. I don't think that that's true. Um, they think it'll happen before the ten horns, ten kingdoms, ten toes shows up. We're waiting. We're sitting here waiting. We're in the legs. We're waiting for the horns and the toes and the kings. And, and, it's, and, uh, and so far, so good, right? I see the ten kingdoms as the one world government. That's what I think. I don't think the one world government is here. I think the one world government is here. Remember in Revelation 17, it says it comes for a short time, for just an hour. It's really short. And we're going to have to wait for me to be proven correct again. When will they learn? It's a minor point. I'll concede that. The issue is what makes this iron beast, this fourth beast, this iron tooth fourth beast of Daniel 7 different from the other three? Don't have time to read it. Gosh, I really need to. Hurry, hurry, hurry. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. This iron beast will be the fourth kingdom, which shall be different from the other kingdoms. Not the fourth head, the fourth kingdom. Different. The fourth kingdom that, does, that, that started from Nebuchadnezzar and took control of the city of Jerusalem. We still haven't figured out who the first two were. Daniel didn't care about those two. It started here with him. It's John that told us there were seven. Daniel is worried about four. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it into pieces. The ten horns of ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and he shall subdue three kings. That's the Antichrist. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom is different. It devours the whole earth. Has any empire, did Nebuchadnezzar devour the whole earth? He was given everything. Did he take it? Did the Romans get all of it? 
No one has devoured the whole earth yet. When does the Iron Fourth Kingdom control the whole earth? The Roman Empire never made it. They reached Britain. They couldn't handle the Scots. They had to build a wall just to keep the Scots from killing them all. You don't, don't mess with the Scots, right? Uh, Alexander the Great went further than the Romans. He went all the way into India. He wanted to keep going. So Rome didn't go that far. Rome didn't even get, you know, they fought with Hannibal and Carthage. They didn't even get, they didn't even get Carthage. Well, they got Carthage, but they didn't get that empire very well. I agree that Rome is part of the iron tooth beast. They are only the unified part. They are not the iron legs at all. And they certainly aren't the ten toes in kingdom. I think the ten toes and the ten horns and the ten kings, that's the one that devours the earth. And, and I agree again. I believe that we are currently within the two legs, the east-west division. But we've not seen this different part yet. There's something different about the iron beast. So far, the unifying is just like not even as big as the British Empire. We've seen this. They did take, they did take Jerusalem, but so did Alexander the Great. He had more territory. So that's not different. Iron legs, two parts of it. Okay. That's not so much different. What's different, what makes the iron beast different is these ten horns, or these ten toes mixed with clay. That's the different part. That's the part that takes over the whole world. And it takes over the whole world because it's mixed with clay. Humanity has not witnessed the devouring of the whole earth yet. The question of when this event transpires remains undetermined. If we add Daniel 7, 23 through 24 to Revelation 17, 12 through 13, we will see the order more clearly. I don't have time to read it, but you will see it. Uh, next week we'll do it. Let me make a mark that I didn't do it. Well, I'll do it later. I always forget because I'm old. The ten horns or the ten toes of iron mixed with clay will be of one mind, it says in Revelation 17, 17. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill this purpose, to be of one mind. So these ten guys, these ten kings with their ten kingdoms get together and they have one mind, one purpose for getting together. They devour the whole earth. They have control of the whole earth. They wrap it in a bow and what do they do with it? They give it to the Antichrist. And that makes them different than any other kingdom that has ever existed. They receive their authority for one hour, then they give the kingdom to the scarlet beast. One hour is a relative term. It appears to devour the whole earth. If it occurs, it does so in the ten toes mixed with clay period. It's short. One hour. Obviously, it's necessary. To, we got to figure out what ten toes of iron mixed with clay is. And you can probably imagine all the opinions on this. It's going to be a challenge. One of the most difficult sayings of Christ, in my opinion, is Luke 17, 26 through 30. As it was in the days of Noah, likewise as it also in the days of Lot, even so it will be when the sons of man is revealed. Remember Lot's wife. I'm not going to do remember Lot's wife again. Yeah, y'all say yay. The pre-flood Noadic era and Sodom are going to return. God said it will. It's going to occur. When? During the tribulation or before the tribulation? What exactly is mankind going to repeat about the Noadic world and the Sodomites? It is not sexual. It's biological. Remember that the pre-flood world is stopped by God. Remember that Nimrod is stopped by God. Remember that Sodom is stopped by God and the Antichrist will be stopped by God. Do they all get stopped by God for the same reason? That's Daniel uh, 2, 41 through 44. Get started on that. Okay, I'm shutting it down now, finally few final thoughts. All of this, the metal, the four beasts, the ten kings, it all ends with Christ. After this, Christ comes. He's the stone that tears apart the image of Nebuchadnezzar. 
He's the Ancient of Days that takes out the final stages of the Iron Beast. He's the Lamb of God that comes in and ends the seventh and eighth head. The stone hits the feet and the toes of the iron beast. So we know that when we see these ten toes that are mixed with clay, we know the stone, Christ, is coming to hit it. That's going to be the eighth kingdom of the seven heads. That's going to be, again, the ten toes or the ten horns. Are the ten kings. All the tens equal themselves. So we can figure it out. Revelation 17, 14 is basically repeated in absolute detail. A little more information. Christ comes and throws the beast, the eighth head, the, the one that the ten toes give the bowed up or wrapped up kingdom to, the, the uh, eleventh or the little horn, he throws him into the lake of fire. So that's how it ends. We'll read all of that next week. But for today, all that you need to know is this simple. Easy as pie, cake, one of the two, piece of pie, all you have to consider is I have seven heads, two we don't know. We start with three, that's gold. That gold is the same as the lion. The silver is the same as the bear. The leopard is the same as the bronze. Or the bronze leopard is the same as the uh, bronze metal. The one is, is the iron beast. The iron beast has three phases. Phase number one is the unified beast. That ended 476 A.D. and 453 A.D. into two iron legs, and there we have sat. What we're waiting for is the devour the earth that is different. It's different because it's mixed with clay. I should read that to you. I won't. But you should. Okay, I will. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the, they will mingle with the seed of men. But they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. There's your Genesis 6 Noatic Flood reference. Good luck with that. We'll see you next week. Thank you.